This is Dominic Pasiga. I'm an urban historian who writes about immigration, uh, working class life, uh, industry, and I've written extensively on the neighborhoods that surround the Union stockyards in Chicago. It would be better if we uh, were actually on a bus together. I could show you more things. We could look, talk about uh, uh, various buildings that are still there. But let me take you on this virtual tour of the neighborhood uh, and, uh, and of the back of the yards neighborhood and of the Union Stockyards. Uh, the back of the yards where nearly everyone claims to have lived. Uh, the map on the uh, right is a 1904-1905 uh, map, which shows the uh, various ethnic groups that lived in the community at the time uh, in the Union Stockyard on the upper, upper right-hand corner. So the back of the yards is to the south and to the west of the Union Stockyard. So it runs basically from about uh, South Halsted Street over to about uh, almost Western Avenue and from about 40, 44th Street, 40, 40th Street South uh, to about Garfield Boulevard or 5500 South. The Union Stockyards opened on Christmas Day, 1865. This is a uh, etching of the original gate, which was located at Exchange Avenue in Peoria Street, about 1871. Uh, the uh, painting on the lower left-hand side is what the stockyard looked like, a, probably looked like at the time of, it op of its opening in 1865. It was smaller than it would eventually be, uh, but it was already becoming the center of the livestock industry. The rail connection proved extremely uh, important. Nine railroads were behind the formation of the Union Stockyard along with the Pork Packers Association and other, uh, other companies. And uh, this brought about this combination of various stockyards that had been located in the area. There have been a half dozen or so stockyards in Chicago and they were brought together as a union in the Union Stockyard in 1865. The railroads were very central to the opening of the yards. Uh, this car carried 25 cattle or 200 hogs or sheep. It was faster, it was more efficient. It was a, uh, created a larger hinterland so that livestock could actually be brought into the uh, uh, Union stockyards on the south side of Chicago, actually originally a suburb of Chicago um, from all over the country. By 1875, many packing plants were locating just to the west of the Union Stockyard and the stockyard itself had grown uh, quite a bit. Uh, here we see a, a lithograph that shows the uh, 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 stockyard. Uh, and uh, if you'll notice the circle on, on the, uh, the left-hand side, that, that is actually the Dexter Park uh, trotting racing uh, racetrack. So that the stockyard was always a sen had a sense of spectacle to it. Uh, and was actually a popular tourist attraction from the very, even before it opened, people were coming down to see the building of this large livestock market uh, on the edge of the city. By 1900, uh, the area to the west of the Union Stockyard was pretty much filled up uh, by major packing houses and smaller packing houses were located in various parts of the neighborhoods that surrounded the Union Stockyard. Um, and this is the complete maturity of the meat packing industry in Chicago at the time. On our tour, one of the first things we'd see is the Livestock National Bank building. As we came down Halsted Street and turned down Exchange Avenue, the Livestock uh, National Bank building, this building was reconstructed after the 1934 fire. Uh, it was uh, based on, of course, uh, Independence Hall in Philadelphia. The idea here was it was a sort of marketing thing uh, that if you were a farmer and you sent your livestock to the Chicago stockyard to be sold, you maintained your independence. Hence, the bank building was to look like Independence Hall. Uh, the building is a city landmark. It is still standing. It is uh, empty at this point. Uh, I'm, I'm told you could buy it for a dollar, but that you then would have to agree to spend about $7 million in, uh, in uh, repairs. The gate, uh, which was just to the uh, west of the bank building, uh, was a Burnham and Root uh, gate. It was designed by Daniel Burnham and John Root, who became basically the architects of many of the buildings in the stockyards. Uh, Daniel Burnham was the son-in-law of John Sherman, who was the vice president and, and general manager of the Union Stockyard Transit Company. Uh, that gate was put up about 1879. Uh, and the small building next to it on, your, on the left was the watchman's building. Uh, and uh, here we see sheep being driven uh, out onto the street and over into the Canaryville neighborhood probably to be slaughtered. Uh, 
This is what the gate looks like today. The small building has been removed and is centered in the center of Exchange Avenue. And uh, there's also behind it a fire monument, uh, one of the worst catastrophes in, in firefighting history happened in the stockyards in 1910 when the Morris plant caught on fire and some 23 people were killed. 21, I believe, were firemen and uh, two were civilians as the building collapsed. Um, that was the greatest loss of life until the 9-11 uh, catastrophe in New York City. So the, uh, the monument is there and it also uh, honors all the firemen who died in the line of uh, duty. But this uh, is the only monument to the stockyard and to the working class uh, uh, lives that uh, were played out there at this time. The stockyard developed into the world's largest livestock market. It covered by its primes some 460, 450, 460 acres of covered pens, uncovered pens, hog houses, sheep houses, uh, etc. And here we see a view looking uh, to the northwest from uh, the cattle pens. Here is a, a look at the cattle pens and the sheep house from the water tower, which was also with Daniel Burnham and uh, a root, uh, structure. And the water tower, this is looking southwest from about what they would be 40 at Morgan Street. Um, you can see the heavy pollution in the background. So this uh, is, is part of the, uh, the, the, the lore of the stockyards in, in Chicago. That is the, the, the pollution, the smells, the, the, the thickness of the, of, of the stench, uh, which coated much of the city uh, emanating from the packing houses and fertilizer plants. Uh, the building in, and at the top of the, uh, um, of, of the slide is the sheep house. And the sheep house uh, had capacity for some 75,000 sheep. So this was a huge coming together of uh, what one author has called men meet miracles. Uh, what the Chicago Tribune called organized chaos, uh, as uh, hundreds of thousands of animals uh, a, a week came into the stockyards, were, per, were sold, uh, then delivered to packing houses, both on market and off market. And about one third of all the livestock after about 1880 were shipped east. Previous to that, the majority of livestock had been shipped to the east, but with changes in the technology, especially in refrigeration, uh, the majority were slaughtered in Chicago until uh, the 1950s. The Stockyard was almost a city unto itself. It had its own hotel, the Stockyard Inn. Uh, it had its uh, uh, own uh, police force. Over 100 uh, Union Stockyard police patrolled the pens and, and the area. Uh, it had its own fire department at one point, and it even had its own L, L system or elevated railroad, which brought people into the stockyards and made a loop around the stockyards and, and packing houses, stopping at all of the major plants, and then went back into the city. The International Amphitheater, which is, you know, was known, of course, for the 1968 Democratic Convention, held various conventions in the 1950s, et cetera. It was a primarily built to house the International Livestock Exposition. Here we see the International Amphitheater from inside the yards looking out. Probably in the late 1940s, you can see on the left of the slide, uh, the Stockyard Inn, which was a fine example of Tudor architecture, supposedly the best example of Tudor architecture in North America at the time. Uh, it has been pulled down, as has been the International Amphitheater. They're all gone. Uh, once the stockyards closed, uh, the business uh, declined very quickly. Men would come uh, into the packing town. What we call packing town was the area to the west of the stockyards and even into the Union stockyards looking for jobs early in the morning. And about 2,000 to 7,000 workers would gather daily in about 1904 at the gates of the packing houses. These were mostly day labor. Those doors would swing open. Uh, uh, straw bosses would come out and point to the men they wanted and bring them in on women also. Uh, there was a high labor turnover, uh, lots of skilled and unskilled workers. Uh, there was also a very large um, white collar workforce. Um, remember these packing houses became international institutions by the, by the time of, by 1900. Uh, and they were uh, dealing with, with uh, the production of meat across the country and sending it uh, overseas and in, in, in large uh, quantities. Inside the packing houses, you see mechanization mass production take over very quickly. The so-called Hereford wheel, which lifted hogs up the slaughter. Uh, this is the uh, uh, machine which uh, took the bristles off the hogs. 
um, as the uh, animals uh, passed virtually passed a, a army of uh, 100 to 200 men and women as they made their way to the coolers. This is the cattle stunner about 1905, uh, knocking out cattle with a sledgehammer. Uh, and uh, those pens uh, were very mobile and you drew, drove two livestock into each one of the pens. Uh, the walls would close, come down, and then they'd be knocked out, they'd be lifted up, and the men on a, on a level below would shackle their hind legs and lift the animals into the air. Unskilled labor was very, very important, and it uh, was a major, an immigration was a major source of that unskilled labor uh, until uh, the 1920s when immigration was beginning to get cut off. Uh, and then a migration from Southern states, especially of African-Americans, uh, began to uh, pick up. And uh, by 1958, uh, as the stockyards were closing down, uh, as, as the meatpacking houses were closing down, um, the um, uh, workforce was about 80% um, uh, uh, of people of color. On the lower hand, the right hand side, you see women working in the sausage department about at the turn of the century. Women workers, women workers were not allowed to use the knife in the packing houses until 1894. Here are women uh, using the knife in, in the sausage department. Uh, this is a uh, industrial photograph used uh, to, uh, to, in part, to prove that the jungle was wrong about conditions. Uh, Upton Sinclair's novel, The Jungle. Bubbly Creek was to the north of the stockyards. It, it um, was uh, highly polluted, as you can see. Uh, it would crust over. Uh, sometimes it turned red with blood. It was uh, dumped into the river from the packing houses. Later on, the packing houses began to use uh, the offal, et cetera, that was thrown into the river uh, for various purposes. They created medicine. They used uh, hog hairs to uh, you know, create paintbrushes. Uh, uh, they used intestines to, to create violin strings, et cetera, tennis racket strings, uh, so that much of this was cut back uh, by, by, by 1910 or 1920. The neighborhood just to the west is the neighborhood we call back of the yards. This is a look uh, down Ashland Avenue, which is 1600 west. Uh, that is 16 blocks west of State Street in Chicago. Uh, Ashland Avenue uh, is a busy commercial strip. It wasn't that much of a commercial strip at, when this picture was taken about 1901. Uh, you can see the packing houses in the distance, the wooden sidewalk along the side here. And into the west of this, that is to the left of this slide, would be the neighborhood itself. One of the first things that you reached when you reached the neighborhood was a, a, a gathering of saloons, about 40 in a row, uh, called Whiskey Row. Whiskey Row ran from about 40th Street south to about 45th Street uh, along Ashland Avenue and basically served the working, uh, the workers in the stockyards who did, would come out to have lunch by you know, lunch, you'd have a beer uh, and a shot of whiskey and you got a free lunch. Uh, the woman pictured on the, on the bottom right-hand side was, uh, was uh, uh, Wanda Couric uh, who owned the last bar on, uh, on Whiskey Row. Uh, everything pretty much is gone except for her bar. She passed away uh, about two years ago and uh, the bar is still maintained by her family. It's called Stanley's. It's at 43rd and uh, in Ashland. And if we were in a bus, we could stop and have a beer and have, have, a, have a hamburger. The back of the yards contains a great deal of working class housing. Um, Samuel Everly Gross uh, was the main developer uh, of this uh, uh, of part of the neighborhood, which he called New City, and which on Chicago maps is still referred to as New City. Um, and they were basically small working class cottages. You see, we're all with darkness, now is light, uh, the working man's reward. Uh, supposedly, it was cheaper to buy a house from Samuel Everly Gross than it was to rent. And uh, a home at, uh, at, at paying off the, the house at $10 a month. It was a very simple house, uh, basically a parlor, a kitchen, two bedrooms, uh, and a hall. Uh, it was at the time uh, not connected to the Chicago water system. The basement was a two room basement with a dirt floor and a uh, privy. Uh, there was no, no indoor bathing facilities or bathroom facilities. So you had a privy, which was basically a hole dug in the ground in the basement. 
um, and then was supposed to be cleaned out periodically. This is an actual picture of uh, Gross Avenue, which is now called McDowell Street. Uh, and you can see the working class cottages. The ditch uh, uh, on the right is the actual open sewer for the neighborhood. And this picture is a picture put out by the city. They were putting in a permanent sewer, which is being dug on the uh, far left-hand corner. The packing houses are just off in, in the uh, background. So these homes were cuddled up right next to the packing houses, right next to the Union Stockyard. Uh, this other, uh, smaller slide is a picture of the alleys about 1920. Uh, garbage was only picked up once or three, four times a week, a month. Well, I'm sorry, once a month uh, or less. And um, you have some of the alley tenements that uh, still exist in the neighborhood uh, on, the, on the alley here. So as we would go on the bus, we would see various uh, two and three flat balloon frame buildings, various structures uh, that were located in the neighborhood, are located in the neighborhood, are now being used over, you know, more than 100 years after they were built uh, by various kinds of immigrant groups that still maintain themselves in the back of the yards. Today, the neighborhood is primarily Hispanic. Uh, uh, that is north, primarily Hispanic north of about 49th Street. And in south of 49th Street is you know, largely African American. Uh, it is still a neighborhood of poor working class people who uh, uh, come into the city uh, from various countries, largely Mexican, uh, and, and and also of course uh, African American uh, residents. These two and three flats uh, so have been home to generations of immigrants and the children of immigrants who poured into the city. Here we see some more street scenes in the, in the, on, on the right, uh, you see the, the double steeples of, a, of what was a, a, a once a Lithuanian church, Holy Cross Parish. Uh, today is largely a Mexican uh, Catholic church. The scene on your left is uh, the 4600 block of uh, South Wood Street. There were, Besides the 40 taverns uh, on, um, on uh, Whiskey Row, there were about an average of three saloons to each block in the back of the yards. Uh, the, the saloons on Whiskey Row were open to everybody, everybody who worked in the yards. Anybody could come in there, have a drink, uh, generally speaking. But the saloons on the interior of the neighborhood were divided up very much by ethnicity. So, you know, pity the poor German who walked into a Polish bar or the poor Lithuanian uh, who walked into a German bar. Uh, there was a story in the newspapers in 1916, in the Polish newspapers in 1916, I write about it in one of my books. Uh, a young, a, a drunken German uh, sort of stumbles into a Polish bar and there are 40 other people in the bar and they all swear to the police that this is what happened. A bottle came to life, jumped off the uh, shelf, uh, hit the German in the head, dragged him out and threw him into the gutter in the street and then hopped back in and turned back into a, uh, a bottle. Uh, this was the story they told the police and appeared in the newspaper. And in the Polish newspaper, the last uh, line says, uh, uh, Germans drink in your own bars. Uh, this was a warning. So it, it's, it's the, the interior bars were heavily divided by ethnicity. Uh, you know, so once again, pity the poor German who walked into a Polish bar, the poor Pole who walked into a German bar, uh, pity the poor Jew who walked into any of their bars uh, at the time. Uh, so these were strictly ethnic institutions in the interior of the neighborhood. Seward School, which is located at uh, 46th and Hermitage, uh, this school uh, was uh, one of the pioneers in uh, industrial education in, in the city and also in uh, night classes. At the time, uh, today it is basically a, 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 a Chicago Public School uh, Grammar School Arts Academy, uh, but it still maintains its original building uh, at 46th and Hermitage. And the school is um, today, like I said before, primarily uh, uh, attended by uh, Hispanic and, and African American students. Um, but at the time, uh, it became a very much a part of the social center of the neighborhood. Um, and it, as I say, it began techno, some technical uh, classes, which were being pushed by the uh, president of Libby McNeil and Libby, uh, a man named Tilden, uh, who uh, thought that uh, one of the ways of raising up the, uh, the working class was to teach them trades. Um, so that program was here for only a short period of time. 
and it was later transferred to the Chicago high schools, especially Tilden Technical High School. Uh, today it's just called Tilden High School, but Tilden Technical High School, which was to the south and east of the yards in the Canaryville neighborhood, uh, but was the, uh, it was only for boys uh, at the time. It did not uh, become a coeducational school until I believe 1967. Uh, when it gave up its uh, technical uh, title uh, and uh, became a, a, four, a regular four-year high school. But Tilden Tech played a very important role in trying to uh, organize children uh, to come in, uh, into the industrial workforce. Davis Square Park, which is located at 40 Fortin Hermitage, uh, and uh, is, was one of the small parks, the progressive small park system uh, that was... Uh, that operated in the city of Chicago, that still operates in the city of Chicago, which was designed about 1904, 1905. Uh, this park came into being. That is, by the way, also a, a Burnham uh, building uh, done by the Burnham family. Uh, the park itself was laid out by the Olmsted brothers, the sons of Frederick Law Olmsted, and by Jane Adams herself, who uh, helped design the park. And of course, the uh, field house, which became a symbol of Chicago parks across the nation, actually across the world, uh, the field houses were adopted on the Chicago model. That field house, which still stands, it's the original one, uh, it had a library. Uh, it had a men's gym and a, and a women's gym. It had meeting rooms and it had a cafeteria, which was supposed to sell uh, food at, at cost uh, to neighbors, uh, to residents of the back of the yards with the idea that uh, uh, they would get healthy food, vegetables, you know, um, fruit, uh, stuff like that, uh, and no alcohol at all, of course, in parks. Uh, it allowed meeting rooms, supposedly, that they could discuss social problems, but they were told they could not discuss politics or religion or union activities in the park. Uh, that quickly disappeared in 1917, the park became the center of uh, labor agitation. On uh, Easter Sunday, 1917, on the steps of the, of the, of the park field house, the first uh, agreement between unions and the, the major packers was signed and, and, and announced. Some 50,000 people flowed into the park, black, white, brown, uh, of all, in, all uh, ethnicities, uh, to celebrate the union victory which was uh, unfortunately short-lived. Davis Square was also important because it gave, uh, it had shower rooms in homes that for the most part were, uh, had no indoor bathing facilities. There were private uh, 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 bathhouses in the neighborhood and, and another public bathhouse in the neighborhood. But Davis Square really became the important uh, 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 scene for, for bathing in the, in the community. It also had a, a large swimming pool, still has a large swimming pool behind the uh, um, field house. And so today it provides much of the same services that it, it, that it did at its very beginning. But this was part of the progressive parks movement. Uh, that is the parks that were designed by people like Jane Adams and, and others uh, to bring what they called fresh air lungs to, uh, 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 to the inner city. Of course, the fresh air in the back of the yard was always covered with the smell of the packing industry, uh, which uh, you know hung on really until the, uh, the, the end of the 1960s and early 1970s. Sherman Park was another one of these parks. It was a much larger park, had a lagoon as well as a field house and a swimming pool and a wading pool for children. This is a, a picture about 1908, uh, looking across Sherman Park uh, to some of the housing behind it. Uh, it was on the boulevard, on Garfield Boulevard in a more elegant part of the neighborhood where middle class and upper middle class people lived just off the edge of the stockyards. Uh, but it served primarily a working class population. Churches were very important. At one time, there were 14 Roman Catholic parishes in the neighborhood. Uh, this was the Lithuanian church, Holy Cross Church. Uh, this is where Jurgis uh, Rutkus would have worshiped had he uh, remained in the Stockyard district. And uh, it was founded in the early, uh, about 1911, this church was built, the parish itself was founded a little bit earlier. Um, this parish today serves primarily a Mexican American population. Uh, and uh, remains uh, active, though it's come upon uh, some real difficult uh, financial times. Um, this is St. Joseph's Church, the Polish church, 
uh, which is a few blocks to the uh, south of Holy Cross at the 48 and uh, Hermitage um, and the interior. Today it is, uh, it has a mass in Polish as well as in Spanish and in English, uh, but it primarily serves, as I said, a Mexican American community. Uh, this was the first Polish church in the neighborhood. There were eventually three Catholic churches, uh, St. Joseph's, uh, uh, St. John of God, and Sacred Heart Parish uh, in the neighborhood, which served a, a very large Polish population. This was one of the larger ethnic groups in the neighborhood. St. John of God is here pictured. It has since been demolished. Uh, as you can see, it was built right across from Sherman Park. Uh, if you look on the left-hand side, it was built across from Sherman Park uh, and was seen as a very important church. The pastor there, uh, Father Grzynski, was a very big advocate of the labor movement, uh, especially during the 1917 to 1922 period. and, uh, and worked tirelessly uh, to help uh, uh, create a, a, a union movement in, in the stockyards. Uh, the local Catholic priests often were involved in labor struggles uh, at the time. I put this church and it's really in Canaryville, which uh, a, a real Canaryville person will tell you is not the back of the yards, it's the front of the yards. It's a largely, was a largely Irish community just to the uh, east of the Union Stockyards, but it also is a Burnham and Root church. And uh, uh, this was probably the best example of John Root's design uh, for churches. It's based on French uh, country Gothic churches. Uh, and, uh, and it is, uh, was primarily built for the uh, uh, Irish population. The pastor, his name was Father Maurice Dorney, and Dorney was known as the stockyard priest. Uh, he, um, he helped to settle various labor uh, difficulties in the stockyards, became friends with John Sherman. John Sherman introduced him to his son-in-law, Daniel Burnham, and the firm of Burnham and Root was used to design his church. Near on Gross Avenue, which is now called McDowell Avenue after Mary McDowell, pictured here on your left, uh, the University of Chicago Settlement House was built in 1894. It was demolished um, in the, I believe in the 1970s. Um, and uh, uh, this became a very important uh, uh, social work institution in, in, in the neighborhood. Uh, became a center of activity, especially for children. They had a kindergarten, they had various clubs, many of them uh, based on ethnicity because Mary McDowell recognized the importance of ethnicity in the neighborhood and was among the first institutions to really greet Mexican Americans uh, when they began appearing in the neighborhood in larger numbers in the 1920s. Catholics mistrusted Mary McDowell and they organized their own settlement house just down the block from Mary McDowell, Mary McDowell's home uh, settlement house. Uh, they created something called Guardian Angel Daycare Center and Home for Working Women. It also has been demolished. Uh, this uh, provided a home for about 40, 45 single women who worked in the stockyards. Uh, they paid for their room and board by, uh, uh, on, on their days off and hours off from the plant, uh, watching children of other women who were working in the, in the stockyards. So it became a very important social institution. It was also a rallying point. Uh, during the 1919 race riot, uh, it was a rallying point of, uh, of, of neighborhood leaders to, to calm uh, any fears that the neighborhood had. Uh, and uh, basically, the, it, this was built by three Polish churches, Sacred Heart, St. Joseph, and St. John of God. Basically, this, uh, uh, the, the priests, the pastors, Father Karabas, Father uh, Grzynski, and Father Holowinski, all came here to tell people that look, the, the blacks are not our enemies, uh, African Americans are not our enemies, they belong to the Union, um, keep out of the riot. And the Polish community, and generally speaking, the East European community as a whole, stayed out of that riot in 1919. I wrote an article about it uh, that appeared some time ago. Uh, it, the riot of 1919 uh, was primarily a riot between the older immigrant groups, that is, uh, uh, Northern and Western Europeans who felt threatened by African-Americans as they came into Chicago. Uh, and I'll remember also that uh, African-Americans tended to vote Republican. So this was, and many of these workers voted Democratic. So this riot was really about housing, jobs, but also about politics. Uh, and of course, it was 
you know, it brought many of these immigrant groups into the sort of racial uh, discord of the country. Um, African Americans and Poles. And by the 1920s, these groups began to side with other white workers against African Americans. 47th National was the center, the commercial center of the neighborhood back of the yards, and it still is. Um, this is the old People's Theater, which was demolished, and uh, the Goldblatt's building, which is uh, gained a landmark status. And actually, while it maintains itself as a department store on the first floor, no, no longer Goldblatt's, but an, another department store, uh, the upper floors are uh, have been turned over to a senior citizen housing. Uh, several of the older commercial buildings, the old Meyer Brothers department store at 48 National has become a condo building. Um, but the gentrification has hardly taken place in the neighborhood. It remains what it always was, a working class neighborhood. Um, by the way, I grew up in the back of the yards. Uh, I worked in the stockyards uh, while I was in college. I worked as a livestock handler and um, I uh, had an intimate relationship with many of the people who lived there, uh, worked there, their, their stories, et cetera. And it was one of the things that made me a historian. Um, as I became more and more interested in the uh, in, in, in why people settled in the stockyards. I was part of a group called Polish Highlanders and still am. And these Polish Highlanders uh, dominated the neighborhood. They dominated the Polish community in the neighborhood. On the, um, they were dressed in their traditional um, folk costumes here on your left in a parade down uh, Walcott Street, which was originally called Lincoln Street. Um, and the church on your right, that is Sacred Heart Parish, where the Polish Highlanders Alliance was founded in 1929. Lithuanian, very large Lithuanian uh, population. If you've read the jungle, you know that uh, the one thing that's not in the jungle uh, is anybody having any real fun, uh, but picnics and taverns and uh, fraternal organizations abounded in the community. It wove a sense of community. It wove a sense of a, a communal nature, which was very, very important. And even when Sinclair came uh, to the neighborhood, he, uh, he, he witnessed these things. He did not, chose not to write about them. Uh, but one has to understand that the portrayal of the neighborhood in the jungle was uh, ideologically centered, of course. Um, and to, even Sinclair eventually admitted that much of it was based on rumor. Uh, he had only went to the packing houses twice on public tours. Uh, by the way, stockyards uh, always had public tours, uh, not always, but for much of its life uh, as, as a meat packing center. Uh, and in 1900, uh, just before Sinclair arrived in the, in the neighborhood, uh, over a half a million people toured the packing houses uh, on uh, tours which brought them through the stockyards, into the packing houses to watch the kills, etc. Those tours were maintained until the 1950s in most of the major packing houses. Um, and uh, I have friends who are a little bit older than I am, uh, who have a distinct memory of seeing the hogs being killed at Swift or at Armour uh, on, on, on class tours. They would take grammar school kids through this. Sinclair's book does not portray any of the, of, of the joy of the neighborhood as well. And, and I think that that is one of the, its major faults. But the communalism was extremely important. When, a, when stockyards went on strike, it was a strike of the neighborhood so that uh, women, children, men, all were involved uh, in this. this is, these are scenes from the 1904 meatpacking strike, which was one of the most violent. Um, and another big strike was the 1921-22 packing house strike uh, as well, uh, including uh, the beating of, of women and children on, on the street by police on horseback. But here's another communal uh, strike scene. This is the neighborhood coming out at 47th and Ashland, one of the major entry points into the stockyards uh, to uh, support the uh, packing house workers who are on strike. So this communal nature, at one point in the 1921 strike, a 1921-22 strike, the winter of 21-22, um, men who did not go on strike, who decided to uh, be strike breakers, scabs, uh, would often come home to their homes to find the crowds surrounding their house. And in some cases, houses were literally pulled apart by angry crowds 
uh, homes that uh, were the homes of strike breakers. Uh, just literally ran, shackled the house, pulled down uh, the uh, various um, you know, porches, steps, broke windows, broke doors. And, and until the uh, strikers would, uh, the strike breakers would, would go on strike. So it was a communal nature. And the ethnic stores and taverns also supported the strike, often giving food, uh, money, uh, donated medicine, etc., to the uh, strikers. Strike breakers, there's, it's a history of ethnic divisions. The Poles broke a strike in 1886. Uh, 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 African Americans were brought in to break strikes in 1904 and, and in uh, 1921. Uh, uh, um, it was a major cause of racial animosity, which led in part to the 1919 race riot. Um, and th that part that was over jobs. Blacks were replacing whites uh, in many of the positions in the stockyards as men went off to war. When they came back, uh, blacks were the first to be laid off. This caused anger in the, in, the, uh, in, in the black community. Whites were blaming blacks for taking their jobs while they were away. There was a tremendous amount of animosity, uh, which led to much of the uh, fighting in, in the, in, on the South side. In which, of course, um, you know, um, I, what was it, 38 people were killed, all men, uh, all male, uh, 15 of them white and 23 African-American. Uh, some 500 people were hurt of these only, I believe nine were women. Uh, this was basically a young man's riot, that 1919 race riot. And it did center on the stockyards. Uh, though, as I said before, the East European groups tended to stay out of it. In fact, at one point, uh, Irish gangs in blackface uh, entered the Polish and Lithuanian back of the yards and set fire to buildings in an attempt to uh, get the, uh, the residents riled up against the African-American community. Uh, once again, Polish leadership, uh, Lithuanian leadership stepped in very quickly to explain that this was not who did it, it was these other gangs uh, who were white gangs in blackface uh, that uh, started the incident in the back of the yards. The Great Migration really changed the patterns in, on the South Side and across the stockyards from 19 to 15 to 1920. The African American population of Chicago more than doubled. By 1930, there were 209,000 Blacks lived in the city. Many of these, of course, worked in the stockyards, both female and male. Uh, and after 1940, of course, a new wave uh, that continued uh, until the mid 1970s, this whole second wave of the Great Migration. Mexicans began to pour into the neighborhood in the 1920s. Uh, you can see on the map to your left, it says the Hull House Colony, then right below it is the Stockyard Colony. That would be the back of the yards. And in the South Chicago and Irondale Colonies, those are those, and the steel mills as there are the colonies in East Chicago and Gary. This little church was built in the 1930s. It, uh, they took three taverns on Whiskey Row, combined them, uh, put a front on it, and uh, uh, eventually uh, built, actually this parish, this church itself was, uh, was built in the 1950s. Um, and uh, was supposed to resemble uh, a Spanish mission uh, in, the, in the Southwest. And this became the center of Mexican community life in, in the neighborhood for a long time. This parish has now merged with that Lithuanian church that I showed you earlier, Holy Cross, uh, to uh, create a, a very large Mexican parish. McDowell Avenue, what well, used to be called Gross Avenue after Samuel Everly Gross. These are tip, three typical storefronts in front uh, that were, uh, have been converted one, of course, was converted to a, a Baptist church, uh, but others into uh, other into apartments. And I can see that the last one there still remained a sort of tavern front. They were probably all three taverns in a row at one point as they made their way down Gross Avenue towards the, uh, towards the packing houses. World War II was transformative in many ways. It changed uh, the uh, uh, ability of, uh, of, of Americans to work. Um, and, uh, uh, and, it, and brought immigrant and children of immigrants into the U.S. Armed Forces. This gentleman in the center here, is, he was in the United States uh, Cavalry until it became an armored unit. Those are his parents in the upper uh, right-hand side uh, celebrating their two sons in the Army uh, at a local victory garden. These women on the left are among the first women to join the United Packing House Workers. Uh, and when that union began to organize the armor and company uh, plant, and they worked in the canning department during World War II, which was a very uh, important uh, 
program for the armed forces. When young men and young women came back from the war, uh, many of the people who lived in the back of the yards did not want to work anymore in the stockyards. They wanted to look for what they called cleaner jobs. And so they moved on to places like Western Electric and Cicero or the Johnson and Johnson plant and clearing um, plants that they saw as more uh, upwardly mobile. And so the workforce of the back of the yards began to leave the stockyards uh, for the most part. It remained a white ethnic neighborhood uh, with a large Mexican population uh, well until the 1970s when most of the white ethnic groups by that time had, had begun to leave. This is the CIO rally on, on Whiskey Roll, in fact, in front of uh, the packing house workers. Uh, local had organized uh, um, the, the stockyards and in 1946, there was a major strike. And here we see um, uh, strikers uh, at a rally in front of the packing house workers uh, uh, offices and they had taken over an old saloon on Whiskey Row. Deindustrialization. In 1952, Swift and Company began to um, close down its plant and close down its hog kill. Um, and uh, a year or so later, Wilson and Company, which is, you can see the plant on your left, uh, began to uh, actually announce it's, it's closing within a few months and simply closed up, uh, put five, 6,000 people out of work. The building, uh, the structure on the right, uh, this photograph was an abandoned uh, uh, armor and company plant, Swift and Company plant, I believe, actually, uh, in the stockyards uh, that had been left basically to rot uh, after the company left. By the end, by 1961, Swift and Armor had completely left the Union stockyards. The stockyard itself maintained itself as a livestock market selling uh, animals to local, smaller local meat packers, and also to off-market packers, uh, especially for the kosher kills uh, in, uh, in the East Coast. Uh, animals would be shipped by rail or by truck to East Coast slaughterers in uh, New Jersey and New York. But on June, July 30th, 1971, the Stockyard's last market day, it's often marked, mentioned as August 1st as being the last uh, uh, the, the closing was official. Uh, so the Chicago Joliet Livestock Market had uh, opened in 1971, and it only lasted about 16 years. That's a picture of the Joliet Livestock Market in the center uh, of, the, uh, of the slide. Um, these terminal markets basically ended. Now, what replaced the Union Stockyard? So today, as we would go on the bus through this area, you would see the Chicago Stockyard Industrial Park. It is the most successful industrial park uh, in the city. Uh, today, about 15,000 men and women work in the stockyards, um, largely not in the meatpacking industry, however. On your right is the old independence uh, modeled uh, Livestock National Bank that we talked about earlier in the course to the front is the stone gate as the bus, as we would take the bus into the yards. So this is what the stockyard industrial park looks like today. It is the home to various industries. Um, and including recycling plants, et cetera. Uh, there are some old packing house buildings. Here's the old Swift and Company building, which is still standing um, uh, just to the uh, west of what was the Union Stockyard. Uh, this was the Swift Laboratories. Um, before that, I believe it was a cattle kill. Uh, and then it was changed into the, la into the uh, labs in about 1948. So this plant still stands. Uh, it is for sale, if any of you are interested. Um, livestock would be driven to the top of these packing houses. They would be slaughtered on the top floors and then would be taken down by gravity to the various floors until the end, the hides ended up in the hide cellar and, uh, and the livestock were, or cattle or sheep or, or hogs uh, were in the coolers. Today, the stockyard uh, park, industrial park is, is the center of a lot of green activity, uh, especially let's say the Testa Produce Company, uh, which does uh, offer tours uh, it is one of the, uh, the, the most energy efficient uh, produce plants in the country. It was given LEED certification. Uh, it is it, about 60 days a year. It's off grid, uh, electrical grid, because of its huge uh, uh, windmill uh, at Testa Produce, which today has become the sort of new symbol of the stockyards. 
Um, the interior shot here shows you uh, men working at the docks, loading produce to be distributed throughout the city and, and, and the nation. There are still meatpacking plants in Chicago. You can still, in, in, in the back of the yards, you can still see men leaving work in, in bloody red smocks, uh, though slaughtering is at a minimum. Uh, this is the James Calvati uh, company. It's a purveyor. They do not slaughter. They buy their meat, probably from Iowa or Wisconsin, and bring it in uh, to be uh, processed here and then distributed. And they probably still give their address as simply as Union Stockyards, Chicago. It is on actually what would have been the main cattle alley. Uh, this was the whole pen section of the stockyards at the time. There are Allen Brothers, another purveyor in Bridgeport, uh, just to the north uh, and east of the stockyards. There's the South Chicago Packing Company, which is also uh, just off the stockyards. This was an old uh, hog slaughterhouse. Now they just simply uh, uh, process meat here. Um, and uh, there's a post-industrial problem in the neighborhood in that um, Gentrification is taking place in Bridgeport, which is to the northeast of the stockyards. And um, these homes, these townhomes were just built uh, a few years ago. And uh, right across the street was the Chipetti Meatpacking Plant. Well, when you pay a lot of money for a new house, you don't really want to smell meatpacking plants when you open a window. And so Chipetti eventually had to give up this plant and eventually Chipetti closed uh, and no longer operates in the city of Chicago. There's only one packing house left, and we'll look at that in a minute, but much of the land has also been turned over to container yards uh, because of the great railroad facilities that once served the stockyards and now trucking facilities as well. Um, these, uh, the, these container uh, yards are, are throughout the neighborhood uh, in various places uh, that were once dedicated to meat packing. Bubbly Creek is still Bubbly Creek. Bubbly Creek still flows. Uh, most of it has been filled in, but here you see a part of Bubbly Creek in Bridgeport to the northeast of the stockyards. This of course was the open sewer for the packing houses. And you can see some older industrial buildings still uh, line it. These are mostly now used for other purposes. They're artist lofts, uh, et cetera. Um, by the way, if you're interested, you can buy a house on Bubbly Creek uh, for about a million dollars and it's uh, in Bridgeport. And um, that house uh, will, uh, the seller will tell you it has a lovely river view. Well, that lovely river view is the river view of Bubbly Creek, uh, the once open sewer. Supposedly, um, and it does, it's still on warm days, you can see bubbles pop up to the top because there's still a bunch of fermenting uh, uh, refuge at the bottom of the, of the river. The Army Corps of Engineers suggested that there was uh, anywhere from, you know, six inches to six feet of debris down there, uh, and that it should be covered over with plastic and dirt, uh, and then the, the river would be clean. Uh, but that monumental task has, has not been uh, taken. Though, uh, from what I understand, Bubbly Creek is a lot cleaner than it's ever been before. I myself would never eat a fish from Bubbly Creek. Uh, that would be sort of against, uh, I think, one's better sense of oneself. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, Bubbly Creek uh, is still there. The plant, uh, this is an old meatpacking plant um, at 1400 West 46th Street. It is the home of the Packing Town Museum of which uh, I am uh, uh, a volunteer at. I, uh, uh, we, we've put together a very interesting, I think, exhibit of the stockyards. But it is also a food incubator, a food uh, industry incubator. So if, uh, there are farms, indoor farms in the building. Uh, there is a brewery in the building. Uh, there are uh, companies that are trying to create meat uh, artificially. Um, and uh, it is uh, run by a man named John Adel, who was a, a very interesting entrepreneur. He's taken two of these buildings, peer, uh, this the old pure food plant, here that they now just call the plant, and another up in uh, to the north of the stockyards uh, and, and turned them over as to these industrial incubators. The last packing house, you know, if this packing house ever closes, it will be the end of a tradition in Chicago, which has seen slaughtering since the at least the 1820s uh, at the, in, in, in the city. Uh, this plant is still at 40th Nashland. Uh, it opened actually in 1968. It's owned by the Barakaitis family, um, a Greek family. Uh, it has its own uh, 
wholesale market behind it. Uh, here we see the hogs waiting to be slaughtered. They slaughter about um, uh, 200, it's a very small operation compared to the big meat packing plants. There's only about 200, 300 hogs and, and goats slaughtered uh, a week here, uh, but it is uh, still a, a thriving business. Ah, so our tour has come to an end. I hope you uh, enjoyed it. I hope you learned a little bit about the stockyards. I wish we could be together in a bus and uh, perhaps someday we will. Thank you.